Hey everybody, how's everybody doing this morning? How's everybody doing this morning? That's good right there. That's good. Thank you. Y'all awake? No, not awake. Well, if you're not awake, before I start talking, like I got no shot at it, okay? So hopefully, well, everyone will be awake because we have a very, very, very important topic that we are talking about these days. If you're just tuning in here today for the first time, we're in the middle of a series called You Are What You Eat. And we are talking about the most important subject as it relates to feeding our souls and our spirits, which is the Word of God, the Bible. Every single person in this room, as soon as we finish service here today, is the first thing he's going to say is, I am hungry. I want to eat. And everyone, all of a sudden, the shuffle begins. And oh, who's going to go to Kosi? And who's going to go to uh, this place? Who's going to go Chinese? Who's going to go Indian food? And all the shuffle begins. And that same thing's going to happen about four or five later, four or five hours later, same shuffle. We're going to dig in the fridge. What are we going to eat? What are we going to eat? And we're going to wake up in the morning. What are we going to eat? What are we going to eat? And all throughout our days of our life, we spend so much time and energy focused on what are we going to eat? What are we going to eat? Because we want to make sure that these bodies are well fed. Well, what about what's inside the body, which is our spirit? And the fear is, when we started this series, I said the fear is that if we went inside and we talked to our souls inside, our souls would say, I am hungry. Somebody feed me because I'm starving. And all we do is we spend all day feeding your flesh. And you and I both know you could stand to feed that flesh a little bit less. All right. And I'm in here and I'm suffering and I'm dying and I'm the one who needs to eat. And that's why what we're talking about here is the word of God, the Bible, because you are what you eat. You eat junk food, you eat physical junk food, you will be junk. And your body will be junk and you will not be surprised if all you do is eat junk food that your body doesn't perform to the level that you want it to perform at. If it doesn't have as much energy or doesn't have as long a life or isn't as healthy, you wouldn't be surprised. If all you do is eat Twinkies all day, you wouldn't be shocked if you didn't make it to 100 years old. Well, spiritually, same thing is true. Some of us, we're confused, and we're down, and we're discouraged, and we're despair, and we're hopeless. And I say, look simply at your diet. Because if your diet is all junk food spiritually, then you should not be surprised when the health of your spirit is down the toilet as well. And like I said in the very, very beginning, somebody who is falling apart is usually, nine out of ten times, I don't want to say always, but someone who is falling apart, nine out of ten times, is someone who is not in their Bible on a regular basis, on a consistent basis. That's the goal of this series, is to understand how the Word of God nourishes our souls and to be practical and discuss how we can find more nourishment in it. What we've been doing every week of this series is we've been having a memory verse every week to kind of remind us of the message of every single week. Y'all remember the memory verses? First week's memory verse here came from Matthew 4.4. 4. Let's read it all together. It says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We talked about how the Bible is not ordinary words. It's the word of God, and it's the breath of God coming through vocal cords, like when my voice is my breath coming through my vocal cords making a sound. The word of God is the breath of God coming through the vocal cords of guys named Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Isaiah, or Jeremiah. It is the breath of God, and that's the food by which our souls and our spirits live. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Week two, our verse came from John 8, 31, 32, and it says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31, 32. This Second week of the series, we talked about the role of the Bible and what the Bible does for us. And we talked about three things that the Bible will do. The Bible will replace lies with truth. The Bible will replace fear with faith. The Bible will replace confusion with the next step. All right. And we talked about these are the three things that we struggle with so much that we have full of lies in our mind is that we are afraid to take steps, we lack fear. And number three, we are confused. And when we are consistently in the Bible, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples, and then you'll know the truth. Not just you know the truth, but you're in my word and you'll know the truth. We can't separate verse 31 from 32. And then last week, week three, our verse came from Psalm 119, verse 18. Read it with me. It says, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your laws. Psalm 119, 18. That's why I love that beautiful song that we just sang together. It was a very beautiful song about open my eyes. And my heart. And this verse that we said, we talked about last week, 
We said that God speaks plainly to the one who listens submissively. And when we go to the word of God and we say, God, open my eyes that I, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. It's not hide and seek. Like God wants to reveal himself through his word more than you want to see him. Like God wants to show himself more than you want to find him. It's not a game of hide and seek. We talked last week about how our attitude is more important than our technique. Our attitude that we approach the word with is more important than the technique that we use. Now this week, we're going to focus on technique. And I said that attitude is more important than technique, but we still, we want to talk about technique. And what we want to talk about today is how to study the Bible and how to read the Bible and go in depth into the Bible. Maybe you're good at reading the Bible, but you read it and you have a good attitude, but you're not finding depth in it. Sometimes people come to me and they'll say like, I'll share something from the Bible or I'll give a sermon or I'll say something. They say, how'd you find that in the Bible? Like, how'd you find, like I read that passage a hundred times. How'd you find that? And then people always say to me, you're really creative. And those who know me know, am I creative? I'm not creative at all. <laughs> you don't need to be so emphatic about it, okay? I'm not a creative person at all, but I'm a person who believes in systems. And I don't believe that finding depth from the scripture is about creativity. I believe it's about having a good system. And I believe in, if you don't have a good system, then you're up to your own creativity and whatnot. But we can develop a system, because I believe strongly in systems for everything. Develop a system that we take every time we have the Bible, that we put it through a certain process, and that process will help us to find depth. And the key to that process is one thing, more than anything else, the key to studying the Bible, meditating on the Bible, going deeper in the Bible, call it whatever you want, going beyond the surface, is learning to ask the right questions. The Bible, any book that is written, is as deep as the one who wrote it. A book is as deep as its author. The author of the Bible is God, who is infinite. And therefore, the depth contained in the scriptures is infinite as well. The Bible is like the ocean. Can you ever say, I got to the bottom of the ocean? I got to the deepest part of the ocean. What happens as soon as you say, look, I'm in the deepest part of the ocean? You keep going and it goes deeper. And you say, okay, now I'm in the deepest part. But then you know what? If you keep going, actually, there's deeper. And you can never actually say, I got to the deepest part because the sand's always moving and all that kind of stuff. There's always deeper. And that's the way the word of God is. How come the Bible, like if you think about it, how come the Bible is the only book in the world, any other book in the world, you read it once. Maybe if it was really good, you read it twice. But I doubt that you're going back over a book that you read in 1996 and you're reading it every single day a little more. Like imagine that you have a, 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 a newspaper or a magazine and it's so exciting and so interesting. And then I bring you, hey, look at this newspaper from last year. Let, you want to read it again? No matter how interesting it was, not even last year, last week. I bring you a newspaper from March 17, 2014. No matter how interesting it was on the 17th, it is completely outdated on the 23rd. Or, yeah, 23rd. It's completely outdated. The Bible is the only book that every time you read it, like there's a verse in the Bible where Jeremiah says that God is new every morning. All right, God's mercies are new. God's word is new every morning. Today we read the story of the Samaritan woman earlier in the church service. That's the same story we read last year at this exact same time. And that's the same story we read the year before at the same time. And that's the story we're going to read actually in a few weeks again. The story of Samaritan woman, I probably read that story a hundred times. But today I'm reading it like it's the first time I ever read it. Story of the prodigal son. Story of the five loaves and the two fish. These are stories that we read often. Story of Genesis, creation. Every time we read it, we find new depth within it because the Bible is infinitely deep because the author of the Bible is infinitely deep. That's why we need to have a good system. We need to have a good system to find the depth every time and to every time take another step. And asking the right questions is the way to do it. And I'm going to talk about today, all right, I'm going to share one method of studying the Bible. Not the method, but a method that I employ, okay, and kind of shaped it up to kind of make it kind of neat and clean to kind of share. And this is the way that I have found that is, is effective for me. I'm not saying it's the only way, and there may be other ways, but I, I, can, I can only share what I know. So I'm going to share kind of my system that I use. And our memory verse for this week is Colossians 3.16. Read it with me, please. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. The theme or the mind that I, the picture I want to draw for you is that we want to now talk about not reading the Bible. Not reading. We want to talk about studying or meditating or going deeper. And the picture that I'm going to draw for you is the difference between chugging a glass of water versus sipping a glass of wine. Chugging water versus sipping wine. Chug, 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 chug. Versus not even, you don't start with a sip, you start with a, right? And then you, right? You, I'm not a wine drinker, but don't you swish it around? In the TV shows, you, you swish it around, right? And then, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. There's a time for drinking water, and there's a time for reading, and I'm not negating the importance. I actually believe very much that you should be, have a time where you just read the Bible, and you read, like, for distance. But then it needs to be a time where you read for depth. Like, we don't want to do just distance or just depth. We want to have balanced approach. Today I'm talking about depth, how to take the Word of God and take a shorter passage oops, and go deeper within that shorter passage, all right? And this is the picture, like I said, of sipping the wine versus chugging the water. I'm going to find, we're going to find a passage in scripture. We're going to read that passage together. It's not a very, like, dramatic passage. It's actually a very seemingly irrelevant passage, which doesn't have much depth. We're going to read it together, and we're going to go through the process, the system that I would use. The goal is two things. Like, we'll get some nice depth from the passage, but really the goal greater is the methodology, okay? So we're going to do, like, a case study together of a passage from Philippians chapter 2. We're going to read it together, and we're going to go through the questions that we're going to ask together, and they fall into three categories, as you see in your handout. Observation, interpretation, application. And with each one of them, there's going to be a question that we're going to ask, and the goal is to figure out how to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. Not superficially, but richly. The passage we're going to read comes from Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 to 30. Let me give you a little context before we get into the passage. What you're going to find in this passage is a seemingly insignificant part of Scripture. There's nothing major that happens in this. Basically, St. Paul, this is the epistle to the Philippians. So the Philippians means the people who lived in a city called Philippi. Okay, so St. Paul went to Philippi, like modern day where Greece is, and he went and he started a church in Philippi. And he stayed there and he ministered there and he met the people and he started the church. And then he traveled on and went to other places. Eventually, he found himself in prison in Rome. So he's in Italy and the Philippi is in Greece. So they're not that far apart. But now he's in prison. And as he's in prison, he's sending a letter back to them. Okay, that's why it's called letter to the Philippians. If St. Paul was writing a letter to us, it would be a letter to the Virginians. Okay, if he's writing a letter to the Marylandians, okay, whatever it's called, all right? Philippians just means the people who lived in the city called Philippi. As he's here in prison and he's nearing the end of his life, he really wants to go visit them, but he knows he's probably seen his last freedom, okay, and he's probably going to end up dying. These Philippians loved Paul so much that they collected an offering, they collected, like, a gift that they wanted to send to Paul while he was in prison. So they sent this gift to Paul by the hand of a guy named Epaphroditus. Say that with me. Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is from the church of Philippi, and he carries the gift to Paul. Now Paul is writing a thank you letter back to the Philippians and just basically saying, thank you for loving me and taking care of me and for the gift that you gave me through Epaphroditus. And he says some other things in it, which we'll read. But that's pretty much the essence of the passage we're going to read. So where's the depth in it? We're going to read the whole thing through. Then we're going to go back and put it through the ringer of the process of observation, interpretation, and then application. St. Paul says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may also be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. First thing he says is, I want to come visit you, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to make it out of prison. I'm probably going to die here. But I would really love to send Timothy to you because Timothy is as close as you can get to me. And he says, Timothy, he's the best. I hope to send him to you as well. 
But you know his proven character, that as a son, speaking about Timothy, as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. He's saying that, but he knows like he's probably not going to actually make it out. And he, and he gets martyred when he's in prison. Now he shifts gear. Now that I was talking about Timothy, now he talks about this Epaphroditus guy. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, and my fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was bringing, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. He's saying, I'm sending Epaphroditus back to you, and he says these nice things about him. He's my brother, my fellow worker, but he is your messenger because he's one of you, and he brought me this nice gift. And he was distressed because you heard that he was sick. I'll talk about that. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. That's it. How would most of us read this passage? We'd say, okay, that's nice. Timothy's a good guy. Epaphroditus, don't know how to pronounce his name. Okay. Let's get to the miracles. Let's walk on water. Five blows, two fish. Blind man. Let's, let's get to the good stuff. This is one of those, like, we read it. Okay. That's very nice. Turn the page. And if you did that, especially as you see, I'm going to speak specifically today to the gentlemen in the room. If you did that, you'd be making a big mistake. Because there's depth inside this passage. And we're going to see how this passage, as we put it through the ringer, is speaking to us about what does it mean to be a man of God in the world today? And what are the marks? And what does it take? And it applies to women too, but specifically to men. And in this passage, this seemingly trivial, insignificant passage, we get gold as to what does it mean? What is God looking for in us men today? But in order to find it, we can't chug it. You chug it, you miss it. We need to sip it. Three questions. Observation, interpretation, application. Question number one, observation. This is the simple part. This is the easiest part. Observation, you ask one question. What does it say? What does it say? This is simple. All you need to do is write down one or two bullet points or three bullet points and just simply, what does it say? No analysis, no meditation, no interpretation, no study, no nothing. Just very simply, what does it say? And the reason why that's important, because so often we jump to what we think it means. Not even we jump to what it means, we jump to what we think it means. We jump to what we heard a sermon about a year ago. Or we jump to what I want it to mean. No, 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 no. Let's take it at face value. Let's be simple. And let's write down simply, what does it say? I believe very strongly that the difference between chugging and sipping, the difference between reading and studying, is simply a pen and paper. I believe very much in writing down. Even if I used to think to myself, like, I'm going to save all these notebooks and all this stuff, I end up throwing them away, okay? But there's value in the process of writing. To write down, what does it say? Don't assume you know what it says. As you see in your handout, I took this passage, and I would say, really, two things that I observe from this passage, okay? And we'll just go through them real quick. First thing that I wrote is Paul intends to send two men to Philippi. Would you all agree with me? That's what he said. He's talking about a guy in verse 21 named Timothy. I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly. And then he, in verse 25, speaking about Epaphroditus, I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. First thing I know, I didn't analyze anything, is Paul is writing a letter to the Philippians saying, I want to send Timothy to you, and I want to send Epaphroditus to you. That's it. And the second thing that I took from it is that those two guys, there's something special about them. I don't really know what yet. I'll discover in a little bit. But those two guys are somehow role models to be honored and to be followed or imitated. And how I got that from verse 20, speaking about Timothy, he said, I have no one like-minded. All right, and we'll see in other translations, I have no one like Timothy in the whole wide world. And then in verse 29, he speaks about Epaphroditus. Receive him, therefore, and hold such men in esteem. So I see he's going to send two people, 
And there's something special about those two people. So the third bullet that I would write down, which I don't have the answer, but I'm asking a question, is what's special about those two guys? Like there's got to be something about them that would make them kind of stand out in Paul's writings this way. What's special about those guys? That's it. That's observation. Was that complicated? Did you need a dictionary? Concordance? PhD in Greek? Do you need anything? All you need is a piece of paper and a pencil and a Bible. You read. This is third grade. Okay? Write down what you observed. Just write down one or two bullet points, but be faithful in the process of writing it down because we want to see what does it say, not just what, what we think it says. Now we're going to get to step two. Once we did observation, and this is where you're going to spend most of your time, is interpretation, which is not what did it say, but what does it mean? Now, wait a minute. Hold on. Are you saying that what it says is not what it means? The Bible is like tricky, pulling a fast one. It says left, but it means right. It says up, but it means down. Does the Bible say what it means? No, the Bible means what it means. And it's not just the Bible. Every form of communication in the history of all mankind must be interpreted in the context in which it was written. For example, you can't just take a statement at surface level without understanding what was it meant to say. You can't just say, what does it read? What does it mean? For example, let's say I send a text message to somebody, all right? And I, you know, I say, uh, hey, stop pulling my leg. Send her a text message, stop pulling my leg, all right? And then one day, when I'm dead, okay, and Sandra's a famous person, all right, and I'll say, hey, I knew a famous person, all right, and I knew this famous person, and we used to exchange text messages. And they take our text messages and they put them in the uh, Hall of Fame, the Priest Hall of Fame or whatever Hall of Fame, all right, and they record these text messages, all right, which is written in English. And then let's say a thousand years from now, these text messages are preserved in the Priest Hall of Fame, wherever that may be, in a foreign country, in a foreign culture, that speaks a foreign language that doesn't know anything about the context of the time. And they look at my text message, and it says, Sandra, stop pulling my leg. They will think, if they don't understand the context, what does it say? It means that she grabbed my foot and <laughs> yanking on it. And the more I write, hey, stop pulling my leg, say, she was a very violent person. She was always yanking people's legs. What it says isn't always what it means. You have to understand that we understand when someone says, stop pulling my leg, they don't mean stop yanking my, my foot. They mean stop joking with me. If you don't understand the context, you don't understand the culture it's written in, what it says is not what it means. In Spanish, they don't say, stop pulling my leg. You know what they say? They stop pulling my hair. Tomar el pelo. I remember very few things from Spanish, but I remember that one, right? So that expression, okay, like if we said that one, some of us, they would say, like, we're liars because that's not physically possible for some of us. Like if we wrote down, stop pulling my hair, they'd say, these people are crazy. They didn't have hair, okay? <laughs> the point is, is what it says and what it means aren't necessarily the same thing. And that doesn't make the Bible unreliable or inaccurate. Like any other thing in the whole wide world, we understand that there's context involved, and the same is true with Scripture. That's why one of the things that I like to do, and I know some people do not like to do this, and if you don't like to, that's fine. I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just telling you what I do, and even if you disagree, that's fine. I disagree with you. You disagree with me. That's fine. I like to read multiple translations of the Bible. Now, you got to be careful because there are some translations that are funny, okay? But there are many translations that are reliable and that are good, and I believe there's a lot of value from looking at different angles to the same passage, and using different words to describe what is trying to be said. You know why? If you were to get a Bible that is written in Hebrew and Greek, the original languages, you would find that average, like a roughly, approximately, there are 11,000 words in Hebrew and Greek in the Bible. An average English translation of the Bible has how many words in it? Meaning how many words are used? Not total, like, words that are in it, but saying how many different words are used throughout the scripture. Like the word the is a word, even if it's used a thousand times. The word a, the word uh, boat, the word um, shoe, like whatever. Hebrew and Greek, 11,000 words are used. English, 8,000. That's 3,000 words that are missing, that have been kind of combined into other words. 
So we can't say that there's any one version of the Bible that is 100% accurate in English. Bring me any version of the Bible, and I'll find you an inaccuracy in that Bible. Because that's the way it is. But what we can do is when we look at different angles, we find them complementary, not contradictory. I'll give you an example. The word love. The word love. In English, there's one word love. And we use that one word. I love God. I love my wife. I love pizza. I love sunny days. I love God. I love my wife. I love pizza. I love sunny days. One word to describe my feeling toward these four different entities. Clearly, my feelings towards God and pizza are not the same. Towards my wife and sunny days, well, maybe they're the same because anytime I see my wife, it is a sunny day. <laughs> ah, ah, that'll make it for last night, hopefully. <laughs> Clearly, the word love has different meanings. How I use it towards pizza, how I use it towards my dog, how I use it towards sunny days. Like, it means different things, but in English, it's just one word, love. In Greek, there's many words for love. One of the times in the, in the Old Testament, and one of the Psalms, there's a Psalm that says, in the New King James, his love endures forever. His love endures forever. In another translation, it says, his mercy endures forever. So did that contradict that? Or did that complete that? Now I see, I understand what kind of love he's talking about. He's not talking about, like, a romantic love endures forever. He's not talking about, like, I love pizza like a, like a friendship love. He's talking about the mercy aspect of love, like a father to a son aspect of love. That's the aspect of love that endures forever. The two didn't contradict. The, true completed, the two completed one another to give me a complete picture of what the scripture is trying to say. So now, let's go back to our, our methodology here. We are going to ask for this passage, what does it mean? And you'll see I'll pull in some different translations here. I'll pull in from the NIV a couple times, and it'll complete our picture. What we're going to see, as you see in your handout, is that this passage talks about these two guys. I'm sending them to you. They're very good guys. I don't know why. It gives us the five, it gives us five marks. I don't want to say the five, but five characteristics of what does it mean to be a godly man, like in God's perspective. What does God say it takes to be a man who is honorable in his eyes. Y'all are going to help me out. I'm going to bring you the verse. Y'all going to help me fill in the blank. We're going to start in verse 20 and 21. He's talking about Timothy right now. And he says, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. He says, I got no one like this Timothy guy. Which if you think about it, who's writing these words? Who's St. Paul? Like St. Paul. Like other than Christ, it's St. Paul. Like no one walked the earth like St. Paul. And St. Paul said, all these disciples that I got, man, I never seen someone like this guy right here. I got no one like this guy. These are big words. That's what I'm saying is, we're not just going to chug this? Wait, 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 wait. He said, I got no one like this guy? No, 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 no. I need to ask, what's this guy like? Because I want to be someone like this guy. Where St. Paul says, there's no one like this guy. So y'all help me out here. Give me a characteristic. As you see on your handout, we're going to talk about five marks of a godly person. A godly man, but again, again, applies to women too. A godly man is what? Shout out some words based on this passage. Caring. Okay. Selfless. I put unselfish, which fits exactly what you two said. Okay. The word isn't important. The idea is important. A godly man is unselfish. Above all else, you want to be a man of God? Gentlemen, forgive me. I'm going to be a little tough on the guys today. The problem in the world today is that men are not unselfish. That's the problem. Because from page one of scripture to page whatever's at the very end, the principle is the very same. Those who are strong take care of the weak. Those who are strong do not look out for themselves. They look out for the weak. And the problem in the world today is that we men have given up that duty. And now... Again, when I say I'm talking about mankind, I'm not pointing fingers because I'm, there's men in this room who are the exact opposite of that. But I'm saying as a, as a whole, as a society, we have ended up using our strength and our power to care for ourselves and to look out for our own interests and to see what pleases us. And not, like one of the things I always tell my son Michael, okay, like whenever I leave and go out of town, I always tell him, Michael, you're the man of the house now. I say, what does it mean to be the man of the house? And I always teach him that a man of the house 
doesn't do what he wants, he takes care of everyone else in the house. That's why like, one of the things that I do, I don't do it because I'm, an, I'm not saying I do it this way, but I show him as an example. I eat anything. Okay, I don't care what I eat. So when I find like, okay, the kids like this food, then I don't eat this food. But he's like, no, but you like this food. I'm like, yeah, but a man, a dad saves the good food for his kids and a, and a man eats the bad food for himself. And a man makes sure that everyone else is tucked in and sleeping before the man sleeps. But of course, he doesn't really do that with the mom. But he puts a sit, like, I want him to know, like, make sure that everyone's taken care of. Because that's what a man is. A man is unselfish. A man looks out not for his own interests, but he's caring for the interests of others around him. Genuine concern for the welfare of others. That's not what you see in the world today. The world today says, however you feel, do what you feel. You deserve a break. You had a hard day at work and you feel like relaxing, you deserve to come home and relax. Doesn't matter what anyone else, it's all about you. And you know how you can tell this consumeristic mindset that has infiltrated us? Look at the amount of money that we spend on entertainment. There is not a society in the history of mankind that has spent as much money as we spend on entertaining ourselves, on pleasing ourselves, on making ourselves feel comfortable with movies and TV and music and video games and all these things, which is all about me feeling good, not about me making others feel good. For the ladies in the room, I'm sorry to the gentlemen what I'm about to do to you. For the ladies in the room, I found something nice online, okay? It talked about how to identify a selfish man before it's too late. <laughs> sorry, guys. I'm giving away our secrets, okay? But I'm happily married, and that's it. We're stuck, so she can't do nothing about it, okay? <laughs> but you're single. You hate my guts. I'm sorry, okay? But we love our sisters in Christ, so we need to make sure that they see this list, all right, and they know what does it mean to, how do you identify a selfish man before it's too late? Eight characteristics. These are not mine. Something from online. I take no credit for it. <laughs> Don't, no blame for it. I'll just read through them quick. Number one, does he talk only about himself? Number two, does he ever open the door for you? Number three, does he ever go out of his way to do something for you when he knows you're busy? Like, he knows you stayed late at work, so he picks up dinner for you. Or he knows you don't have time to get your dry cleaning, so he goes and gets it for you. He ever does something when he knows you're busy. Does he ever ask for your opinion? Husbands, write this down. Wives have opinions, okay? It's important that we ask about it every now and then. Does he ever ask for your opinion? Or it's just his opinion, and he just assumes that's what he does. Number five, does he pick up his mess? Or does he expect you or his mother to pick up his mess? Number six, will he ever cancel or adjust his plans if you need him to? That's a big one. Number seven, is he obsessed with his appearance? <laughs> Number eight, no interpretation here. Number eight, will he do something that he doesn't like to do just to be with you? Aw. <laughs> now, for some reason, I was kind of expecting all the single guys to write down that list. I found all the married women writing down that list. <laughs> I don't know what that says, <laughs> but good luck to you guys <laughs> when you get home. <laughs> Moving right along, a godly man is unselfish. Second characteristic of a godly man, verse 22, you all are going to tell me, says, speaking still about Timothy, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. You know his proven character. A godly man is what? Shout it out. Huh? Proven, okay, more, more descriptive. Wise, okay, huh? Tested, okay? The word I came up with is dependable. Okay, but dependable you know through tested. A godly man is dependable. A godly man has proven his word is as good as done. A godly man, you know where you stand with him. You're not guessing. Guys, again, forgive me. We're wishy-washy. Some days we're up. Some days we're down. Some days we're the happiest person to be around. And some days we are drama all around. We are the word that somebody coined recently. Okay, is a word that I like. He said wiggly. Right? We're wiggly. Guys, we've become wiggly as a group where you don't know what you're getting with us. And we're moody. And we're grumpy. And again, sometimes we will lead you to the promised land. Other times you don't want to come near us. Man of God is dependable. And guys, that's what our families and our world needs. And guys, we're supposed to be the rock. And we're supposed to be the ones that when, don't, like, don't no one read more into what I'm saying. 
when the ladies around us are emotional, okay, and the ladies around us are up and down with stuff. We're supposed to be the rock. We're not supposed to be when they're down and we go even further down and we make them have to be the rock, which is not a role that God intended for them to be. Like, that's our job, and we have given up that job. Why? Because we're wishy-washy. We're wiggly, and you don't know where you stand with us. Timothy was proven. Timothy was solid as a rock. Timothy was a man, watch me this word, a man of conviction. Y'all know what conviction means? They say that opinions are something that you argue about. Convictions are things that you die for. And we are men of opinions. We need to be men of conviction. And conviction, as the saying goes, you're not ready to live until you know what you're willing to die for. Do you know what you're willing to die for? You have conviction or you wiggly. Number three. Again, I'm not, I'm not going in depth. I'm just trying to get the methodology, but we can learn while we're going through it. Verse 25. Now we're talking about Epaphroditus. Okay, so we shifted gears from Timothy onto Epaphroditus. This is what he says. He says, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, and fellow soldier. Brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. This one's a little bit harder. Godly man is what? Based on this. This one's a little bit harder. You want to guess? Leader, okay. On the right track, but not necessarily. Huh? Who? I didn't hear it. Loyal, fighter, okay. I see, okay, companion is very good. I see three relational terms, three relationships being described here. So what I say is a man of God is cooperative. He's a team player. He's not a lone ranger. He's not an island. He knows that he needs others and others need him. He knows that he is a brother. He's part of a family. He knows that he's a fellow worker. That we're not just a family who sits around, but we are working. We have a mission together. And he knows there's going to be times where he's going to need to throw down the gloves. And he's going to need to fight. He's going to need to fight to protect his fellow, his family, those who are around him. A man of God would never say the following or have this attitude. I don't need to go to church. I'm fine. Why well, do I need to go to church? I don't need to join a life group. I'm fine. I don't need fellowship. I don't need, to, I don't need any of that stuff. All that wishy-washy kumbaya stuff. I don't need that stuff. I'm fine on my own. I got it all figured out. Man of God realizes that he is weak on his own. And he needs others. And even more so, he realizes that others need him. And then we in the body, we complete each other. And the man of God knows that if he removes himself from the body of Christ, he is weaker and others are weaker. Everyone is in a bit worse off position. A man of God is somebody who is easy to get along with. Is a cooperative person. Is someone that when they join your team, you say, Whew. not you say, uh. You men, we men, men of God. We should be, people should see us as we are people that work hard, but we play hard. We are great people to have on the team because we will be unselfish, and we will be cooperative, and we will be a part of a team, not as a lone ranger, but we will contribute to that team in whatever way we can. All right? Again, I'm going through quickly here. Go, I'm trying, don't forget, what we're on the step of is not what does it say, but what does it mean. Next, okay, verse 26. This one's a little bit harder. Okay, and I'm actually, let me give you a little context in order to understand this. The context here, remember I said, uh, Philippi church is right here. Paul is in prison. They love him very, very much. They're here. They hear he's in prison. They want to send a gift. So they take a collection and they collect a gift. Now there's a problem. Who's going to deliver that gift? So they say, we need somebody to go to Rome, to the prison, and deliver this gift. Epaphroditus says, me, me, me. I'll do it. Epaphroditus, okay, going from Philippi to Rome was a journey of probably several months each way. Like it wasn't like today. You didn't hop on a plane or a train or an automobile. They didn't have any of that stuff. All right. They had to walk. Maybe if they were rich, they maybe had a donkey for some of the way. It was a very long journey. Epaphroditus left his family, 
We know he was a businessman, so he left his business as well. And he didn't get compensation. It's not like there was like, you know, any money being given to him. He left at his own expense. And while on the way, what we discover is that he got sick. He actually got very sick, and he almost died. But while he was on the way, he gets sick, and he discovers when he gets there that the church in Philippi discovered that he was sick. You understand with me? He got sick, and he almost died. And the church in Philippi discovered that he got sick and almost died. And that's where we get the context of this verse right here. It says, since he was longing for you all, Epaphroditus was longing for you all, and he was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. This is a powerful verse. You understand what it's saying? What does it say? A godly man is what? A godly man, sensitive is good, is considerate. But exactly like that, sensitive. Think about what it says here. I'm sick, and I find out that you found out that I'm sick, and I'm worried because you guys are worried that I'm sick. What? Like, I'm not worried that I'm sick. Because I got sick, and I didn't care that I was sick. I kept on journeying. I didn't turn around. I kept on going. But the whole time, I'm like, they're going to be worried that I'm sick. And I don't want so-and-so to be upset. And so and so is going to be sad. And this guy's not going to be able to pray. And this girl's going to be all worried. What? You're sick. Men, when we're sick, we don't care about nobody. We want the whole world to serve us hand and foot and put our feet up on this. And we complain about this. And the small is cold. And we're, uh, we moan and we groan. And it's the end of the world when we get sick. It is the end of humankind when we get the sniffles. Epaphroditus was considerate. He was worried about somebody else being upset. He cared about how other people felt. A real man is sensitive and considerate towards the feelings of others. And he would never say, suck it up. Stop being a baby. Let, can I go a little rant right now? Let me go a little rant. One of my pet peeves. One of my pet peeves. And I just heard this recently. Oh. And I know some people say what I'm about to say, and they don't do it in as a malicious way as I'm saying it. So I'm, I'm going to the extreme. But either way, I don't like this phrase at all. And I know some people say it in a nice way, in a funny way. I don't like it at all. You ever heard somebody say, hey, you know what? I just call it like I see it. I'm honest. I'm blunt. I have no filter. No filter. And that's just me. That's just who I am. That's just me being me. And we say it in like a bragging way, as if we're like something to be proud of and something that like, we're more honest than anybody else. We just call it like we see it. There's a word in the English language for people like that. It's called rude. <laughs> it's called immature. Because a mature person knows that there's a time to speak and a time not to speak. And a mature person, like a child, just has no filter. A child says what they, what they think without filter, without worrying. Every one of us parents, you're in that time, we've all been there. You're in the grocery store, okay, and your kid... I remember Michael's three years old or four years old, and he's like, Daddy, why is that person's skin dark? I'm like, shh. <laughs> why is that person's skin a different color? I was like, shh. No filter. Okay, as a child, they don't know the difference. Why is this person's skin dark? Why is this person's skin light? Shh. Don't say that. Like, filter. We don't say those things out loud, okay? As a child, no filter. We just say what we think. It's time for us men to grow up. We don't just say what we think. We say what's right to be said, and we care about the feelings of others. We don't just say no filter, and we say whatever we want. Here's a time and place to speak. Here's a time and place to not speak. That's the difference between a grown-up versus a child. That's my rant, sorry. And the reason why I say it, the reason why I say it like this is because this is the number one problem in all relationships today, especially marriages, is not that people don't care about each other, but people are inconsiderate of each other. I love my wife, and she loves me. But if we're not considerate for each other, then all the love in the world ain't going to do us any good. I love you, and as, as we're members of a church here, and we all love each other, but if we're not considerate of one another, who cares how much we love each other? We step on each other's foot and say, oh, sorry, I didn't mean it. No, filtered. No, filtered. <laughs> a godly person is not someone just who speaks whatever's on their mind, but someone who thinks and cares, how will this be received by the person in front of me? I care about the emotions and the feelings of the person in front of me. Godly man, we've gone through four. Godly man, who remembers what they are? Number one, godly man is unselfish. Godly man is dependable. Godly man is 
Who? Cooperative. Cooperative. Very good. Number four, a godly man is considered. Last one. Godly man, verse 27 and 30. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service towards me. A godly man is courageous. A godly man is courageous. I got the last three with C, okay, so I tried to make it easy for you. Okay. Couldn't get the first two in C's, but a godly man is courageous. A godly man says, this is my mission. Oh, no, but I got sick. But I keep on my mission. A godly man takes risks. But here's the key. Takes risks for what? Not courageous for his own benefit. Not like, hey, I'm courageous. I'm going to start a business. No. Not courageous like I'm going to climb a mountain. No. Not courageous like I'm going to get a motorcycle show how courageous I am. No. Courageous for the benefit of others, not for his own benefit. Courageous for the kingdom, I'm sorry, for the work of Christ. Courageous for the kingdom of God and willing to take risks and willing to put his neck out on the line and do what's difficult, even when it's hard, for the sake of the kingdom of God. Gentlemen, sorry, this is the last one I'm going to say, but I'm, last time we'll get us, but we got, we got to work on this one. Gentlemen, when it comes to our own benefit, we're very courageous. We're very committed. We're very eager to do whatever it takes. Then when it talks about the benefit of others, sometimes that courage declines. It's sunny. Let's go to church. It's rainy. Eh. All of a sudden, the commitment to church. Eh. Life is good. Okay, let's be generous. Life is getting a little bit tight. No, 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 no. Keep more for ourselves. Easy to be courageous with yourself. Easy when the profit is for you. But the true man of God Sticks his neck out. Like, what did Epaphroditus benefit from this trip? What was his benefit? Now, here I am right now. Let's make this, let's make this like, applicable. I say, um, there's a member of our congregation who moved to uh, Toronto, and he's sick, and we need to take him this. Like, we need to send, like, a care package to him. A care package. Because the, 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 the gift from the Philippians to Paul wasn't going to free him from prison. It was just going to make him feel good while he's there. It's a care package. And I say, we need somebody to take a week off of work and to travel up to Toronto. And I got no money, to be honest. Like the church, we're poor. So you got to foot the bill yourself. Take a train, take a bus, take a whatever it is. But it's on you. Take a time off of work. Figure out who's going to pick up the kids from school and who's going to do their homework on Tuesday. And figure it out who's a taker. Everyone would. <laughs> like, <clears throat> Epaphroditus said, I'll go. And I'm sure someone else said, no, me. And he said, no, me. I want you. I'm going to go. And they fought for him and said, I'm going to go. None of us would do this. And I'm not trying to say like none of us would do this in a condemning way. I'm just trying to show you the mentality of a man of God. And I'm not saying that extreme example that I just gave. But what I'm saying is if this is this and we're here, man, we need to start taking steps in this direction. And a man of God is courageous for the work of God, not for his own benefit only. With that said, I want to be very clear on this one. With all the, the, the lessons that we learned, there are exceptions to the rule. And I know there are godly men amongst us that I would point to. For every one of these, I could give you a name and a picture of a person, okay, that I would admire in this area from amongst us. And especially with this courageous one. Because I know there's many men who are amongst us here who I personally admire greatly. Because I think what y'all do for the work of Christ is much greater than you get credit for. And I don't want you to get credit on this earth. I want you to get credit up there. But I want you all to know that this church wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the sacrifice, financial, time, energy of many courageous men. And even just last night, I was very touched by a sacrifice that someone who amongst us here, a very generous, but not even generous as much as the spirit behind it. We have great, great spirit of men here amongst us today and we look to them as examples. So I don't want the guys to think I'm just bashing the guys. And I don't want the ladies to just go home and beat the men over the head with what I'm talking about. Yes, we can work to improve on some things. But there are many things where ladies, you need to be very appreciative of the man that's sitting to your right or to your left. Okay, assuming it's your spouse. Okay, okay. You need to be very appreciative because there are some very godly men amongst us right here. 
And this church wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. All that section was actually section two. First section was observation. Second, sec second section was interpretation. All right, and that was all that section. Third section is application. An application, after we ask, what does it say? What does it mean? We ask ourselves, what am I going to do about it? This, you will not spend the most time on, but this is by far the most important section. Because if you do step one and step two without doing step three, man, you wasted your time and God's time. What am I going to do about it? I read all that. I learned all those lessons, what a godly man is, what a godly man is, what a godly man is. And then I don't just write cute notes in my notebook and say, this would be cute in case I ever have to give a sermon one day about Philippians chapter 2. We take it and we do something with it. The Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 22, be doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving yourselves. If you think that you are feeding your spirit by reading the word of God, you are joking yourself. You are the biggest fool on the planet. If you think that you have fed yourself by reading, 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 and then not doing anything else about it. Your soul is fed when you act, not when you know. And I would say, after we took this passage right here, I would want to write down in my journal one or two most, not more than two, one to two things that I'm going to do different in my life. This isn't easy, and sometimes it's hard to find how's my life going to be different. But I want to challenge you not to finish your Bible reading, your Bible study, until you can point to one or two things that is going to be different in your life because of the passage that you just read. How do I find that? Not every passage has like a commandment to obey. In fact, the passage you read has no commandment to obey. There's something nice you see in your handout, okay? Something developed by a guy named Rick Warren, who's a pastor out in California. And he came up with a, a, a cute little acronym called Space Pets, all right? And Space Pets is the key that he says to finding application in the Bible. And he says every passage of Scripture has one of the following nine things in it. And you see it in your handout, okay? A sin to confess, a promise to claim, an attitude to change, a command to obey, an example to follow, a prayer to pray, an error to avoid, a truth to believe, or something to praise God for. So you would go through the passage, and you would say, does this passage have, like, a sin to confess? Like, I'm reading this as a man, and I read this, and I would say, the conclusion of this, is there a sin that I need to confess because of this? What would you say? Maybe. Okay, maybe I haven't been courageous. Maybe I haven't been considerate. I would say probably yes. As I look through this, I can find a sin in my life that I fall short. Okay, how about the next one? Is there a promise to claim? Was there a promise in this passage? No, there wasn't, but that's okay. Like, we don't need everything and everyone. Is there an attitude to change? Definitely. Okay, for sure. That even if I'm not doing a sin, there's definitely some attitudes that can be changed. And so on and so forth. Okay, sometimes there'll be commandments. Sometimes there'll be um, examples. Sometimes there'll be just something to praise God for or a truth to trust God. Like, every application doesn't need to be the same. It doesn't need to be, I'm going to go do this. But it could be just, I will believe this. I will trust this. Like, whatever it may be, I will pray this. Bottom line is, is what you need to do at the end of your Bible reading, you need to put your pen on that little piece of paper, and you need to write down, how is my life going to be any different based on this passage? You know what they say? They say that you only believe the parts of the Bible that you do. You only believe the parts of the Bible that you do. You want to know why? Let's say you get an email today from your boss, CEO of your company, and he says, anybody who shows up late tomorrow will be fired on the spot. And anybody who comes in and brings donuts will receive double their salary. How can I tell if you believe it or not? If you do it. I see you at Dunkin' Donuts at 7, 6 o'clock in the morning. I know you believe the email. How can I tell if I believe? I believe in the Bible. You believe in the Bible, put your money where your mouth is and do it. Because if you believe in the scripture that I believe in, then there'll be a change in your life. And let me, final thing I'll say on that before I, is when it comes to, let's say you go through these nine and you see many things that you want to change. Start with the most important one. 
Like you may read this passage and say, I need to be more like appreciative of like what my dad did for me. And you say, I need to be, you know, more thankful of nature and creation. And then another one that says, I need to stop being rude to my wife. Don't take the first two and say, okay, I'll work on those and leave the last one till later. You start with the one that's the most severe. Okay, don't, so don't, don't try to fool yourself and sugarcoat it and say, I need to be more appreciative of the creation of God. And you're cursing your kids and cursing your wife when you go home. Start with the one that is the most significant in your life. Last thing I'll say, I won't leave you all with our memory verse. Say it with me again one last time. The verse says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Colossians 3.16. We are, what is the word of Christ dwell in you richly? Before I told you the wine versus the water. I'll give you another example that I always think of with this verse. is a cup of tea. We are a cup of hot water. The Bible is a tea bag. Many of us, we read... You never have a cup of tea, which is just, that's a pretty stinky cup of tea. I got the bag here, and I, is that how you drink tea? How you drink tea? What do you like to do? You like to, yeah, right? And then you, and then some of you are really fancy. You do the fancy spoon, like ringing thing, right? You know how to do that thing, okay? And you get it all, yeah, we're very proud of our tea drinking abilities. All right? and we want that bad boy rich. We don't want just water with food coloring. We want a rich cup of tea. I'm afraid that many of us are scripture reading. <laughs> no, 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 no. We need to go past the superficial. We need depth. We need depth. And we need to read, answer some questions. Read again answer some more questions. Read again, answer. Like we need to let that tea bag, yeah, all right, and then ring it out with the application at the end. We need to go beyond the superficial. We need to grow deeper in the word of God. Yes, there's a time and a place for reading and getting wider, but what I'm talking about specifically today is going deeper in the word of God. You know what happens to a cup of water when you let a tea bag dwell in it richly, it looks different, it tastes different, it smells different. Anybody who goes near that cup of tea says, this is not the same cup that I just saw five minutes ago. Agree? That's what we need for the word of God for us. We need the word of God to change us. We need the word of God to give us hope. We need the word of God to transform and heal our lives. That isn't going to happen from two minutes. You want the word of God to transform you? You must let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, like a tea bag and a beautiful cup of water. Let's stand up together and say a prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, once again, we thank you for your word. And we thank you because your word is infinitely deep and is infinitely rich. And I pray, Lord, that you would allow your word to dwell in us richly, that we would find new depth and new meaning every time we open your word, that you would continue to open our eyes to the wonderful things in your law, and you would let those things to settle inside us and really transform our lives and make us into new creations, that everyone around us would see an, a difference in us. I pray, Lord, that you never let your word to be just a routine, an obligation, or a thing that we do just to check off on a little box but let it to really change our lives and change us into new people, change our marriages into new marriages, change our friendships into new friendships, change us into you, your image more and more every single day. We ask this in the name of your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, with the intercessions and the prayers of all your saints. Hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you all very much. Have a great week.